Hello, I'm Kelly Henderson with Form to Families Forward, and I am so pleased and proud to be here today to share with you one year later special education updates for the Family and Youth Summit 2021. I am the director of Form Families Forward, but I am also a proud member and longstanding member of the Virginia Family Network Advisory Board. So I want to welcome you as an advisory board to this summit and thank you for taking the time to tune into this session. Uh, we will try to keep it pretty quick. I know special education can be a bit of a um, dry subject uh, as there's so many policies and procedures, but given that we have been in this sort of COVID circumstance for well over a year now by the time this is broadcast, I wanted to spend a little time reviewing special education uh, basics, as well as what the implications of the virtual and hybrid settings have been for children with disabilities. So we'll get started. Uh, Form Families Forward Briefly is a family-led resource center in Northern Virginia. We focus largely on serving foster adoptive and kinship families who are raising children and youth with uh, special needs and disabilities. Uh, kinship, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term, is when an extended family member has stepped in formally or informally to take care of a child that is not their birth child. Uh, so usually grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, that kind of thing. It could also be a close family friend. Uh, so we serve uh, those families in particular, uh, but we're always to talk, happy to talk with any family who is raising a child with special needs. Uh, we do our work through trainings and webinars. We have classes, including a brand new opportunity to take a self-paced uh, virtual class on some special education foundations, uh, special education eligibility, as well as um, transition into post-secondary and through post-secondary outcomes. Uh, so those classes are available uh, on our website, again, free of charge um, great ways to learn um, some new things. Uh, we provide consultations uh, directly with a parent or caregiver or professional who's working with our families. Um, usually that's a fairly intensive conversation by phone, by Zoom, or in person. Uh, we run events, usually family events, so the whole family has uh, opportunities to connect with others in our community. Um, Systems navigation, we realize that our families touch many, many systems, and it's important to be able to figure out what system is going to serve you best in what way and who are the players in that system. Uh, we have a great resource directory uh, that is uh, available online. You can search it by jurisdiction. You can search it by trauma-informed um, care. You can search it by insurance. A lot of the providers are in Northern Virginia, but there's also a good number that are outside from Northern Virginia. Again, all available through our website. Uh, we have some videos and other resources. We have a great website, formedfamiliesforward.org. And my email is there in the lower right-hand corner, kelly.henderson at formedfamiliesforward.org. Today, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of um, what's happening now with COVID um, and uh, education. We're going to review the governor's order that happened in February. We are going to review special education foundations, sort of uh, without that COVID lens, and then we're going to talk about, given that uh, set of foundations, what is happening with special education now um, and, and throughout COVID. So uh, that's a little uh, a clip from a, a uh, uh, knowledge is power reminder that um, uh, many of us may remember <laughs> from our youth uh, with Schoolhouse Rock, and truly that is the case. Um, we, as special education um, parents, caregivers, professionals, um, really do benefit from uh, knowing all there is to know and, and taking advantage of that information and using it to support our children. I'm going to pull from two main sources of information. Um, first of all, we did a webinar, hosted a webinar with attorney Maria Blauer, who works for Advocates for Justice and Education in Washington, D.C. That is our parent training and information center in Washington, D.C. We also have a parent training and information center in, in Virginia called Pizzi. I'll give you that that um, information at the end. Um, and we work in that same network, obviously focused on foster adoptive and kinship, but Maria came and uh, came virtually and did a webinar for us in October of 2020, talking a little bit about the nitty gritty of special education during the pandemic. So I'm gonna pull off, I'm actually just gonna use some of the slides that she presented, um, give her full credit uh, and, and we'll talk about a, a little bit of, of the special education piece of that. And then, um, uh, in February, 
Uh, Hank Millward from the Virginia Department of Education came as a guest of the Fairfax SEPTA, Special Education PTA, and did a webinar specifically on recovery services uh, that are related to COVID. And we'll talk more about that. But those are the two sources that I am pulling from, and you will have access to both of those. Um, the governor's order on February 5th, Governor Northam uh, called on K-12 school divisions to make learning, um, in-person learning options available no later than March 15th. Um, and I want to point out the word calls on, uh, because while the word it says uh, there at the top, governor's order, it really was a fairly loose um, re request, strong request um, for schools to, uh, to return as quickly as possible and as much as possible to in-person learning options, uh, but no later than March 15th. This is being broadcast, I think, in April, um, and I am recording this actually um, uh, on March 14th. So uh, we expect that by the time you see this, that your school division or the school divisions you work with or know best probably have some type of uh, in-person option available. Parents and caregivers can, of course, opt out of that and choose to remain, uh, have their children remain virtual. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, by the time you're watching this, there is a, a plethora of in-person options available, whether that's every day of the week. Um, we're actually probably not seeing a whole lot of divisions that are doing full-time five days a week for every child who's interested. But we are seeing probably a lot of um, uh, two, three day a week options for those who choose, um, sometimes splitting classes in half so that there are half as many bodies um, in, in physical classrooms. The other thing that the um, governor's order did is re reference a couple health guidance documents, uh, health department, um, health guidance from the Virginia Department of Health on January 15th, and then also reference the CDC operational strategy for K-12 um, uh, for through phased mitigation to reduce COVID-19, which really talked about the physical plant and, and what kinds of precautions um, and accommodations need to be made in the return to school from the CDC. So those were referenced. And then finally, um, the governor said that the, um, the state would be supporting local decisions around expanding summer learning opportunities. Again, think about that language, supporting local decisions, no requirement, no um, hard order here, but the idea that the state is definitely going to be encouraging, um, not mandating, but encouraging extended learning time during summer um, and uh, determining additional resources to support that. So I'm thinking that there will be some incentives coming down the pike from, from VDOE to encourage uh, schools to find additional summer learning options. Uh, and again, by the time this is broadcast, you may know more about that in your school divisions. So what's special education? Uh, very fundamentally, outside of COVID, before COVID, for um, for decades, since 1975, um, special education has been guided by a federal a federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, um, has some really core and key tenets. Um, special education is defined as specially designed instruction um, that's guided by an individualized education program. We'll hear the term IEP a lot. Um, that is the documentation of the specially designed instruction. Um, and it is really important to recognize that that is the distinction between special education and would say a 504 accommodation plan. Uh, 504 accommodation plans is a um, way to support a child in the regular um, curriculum and the regular general education delivery. Um, so uh, for children who have just a 504 plan, um, they will be likely um, provided accommodations uh, such as extended time to complete tasks. They may be provided a special place to take tests. They may be provided other accommodations that allow them to be successful, but that is not altering the actual instruction, the type of instruction that's being delivered. Special education alters that, that it requires um, to be eligible for special education. That child needs to have a requirement or a need for specially designed instruction. So that's really, really key. Uh, it's at no cost to parents, and it is designed to meet the unique child needs of that, that individual child. So it is that individuals with disabilities is, is purposeful. It is an individualized mandate. 
Um, the guarantee is that a free appropriate public education is available for all children. Um, so we sometimes call that free, that we call that free appropriate public education FAPE. Uh, there is a placement in the least restrictive environment. So children should be in their neighborhood schools, in general education classes to the maximum extent appropriate. And that if they are not, then there's justification made by the team for why they are not in that um, most inclusive uh, setting. Uh, but the, the preference and the, the presumption is least restrictive environment. Protection for the rights of children and their parents. And I put parents in quotes because again, we work with foster adoptive and kinship families, and we know that a uh, parent may not be their birth parent. Uh, so whoever is serving as parent who is making the educational decisions for that child um, has significant rights uh, under IDEA when their child is an eligible child. And similarly, parent participation in educational planning, they are um, welcomed um, members of the uh, team that makes decisions about eligibility as well as makes annual or more frequently decisions about the IEP. Um, so this is, these next several slides are straight from Maria Blauer's presentation. And I just wanna reiterate um, what she said. I think she's an attorney and says it uh, with some force. Um, that special, ed uh, special education is again, that specially designed instruction and related services that provided at no cost to parents uh, that's designed to meet the unique needs of that child. And it can be done in various settings. Um, again, we hope that it is the least restrictive setting and that's the presumption. Um, uh, the rights of a child with a disability to special education is guided by IDA. Um, and the reason that this impacts every child with a disability in public schools is because states get money from the feds. And if they get money from the feds, they have to um, comply with the requirements of, of uh, the IDEA and all states do. <laughs> uh, and states take that those requirements um, from the federal education law and the federal education regulations and they create their own set of regulations. And I will show you um, how to access the special education regulations for Virginia um, for your reference. Um, and so under this law, parents and children with disabilities have certain rights and those rights remain unchanged during COVID. Um, so just to be very clear, um, the law is still the law, regardless of COVID. There is no out, there is no waiver of the rights that I just laid out um, for IDEA. Uh, the regulations in the state and the regulations at the federal level are still the same. And the state and the feds made that very clear early on in, in summer and fall um, of 2020. So any requirements for IEP development, any requirements for review and revision of the IEP, for evaluations and eligibility, for the provision of special education related services, um, for data collection and reporting, for monitoring and funding, those are all still in place. Nothing waived any of those requirements. However, there is an acknowledgement at federal and state level that the methods to meet these requirements may look different during this time. Um, so special education is, whether it's distant learning or hybrid learning or back to in-person, it's still individualized instruction, specially designed to meet the needs of that child right now. Um, and so that means however that child is accessing instruction, whether they're doing it completely from home, whether they have a hybrid or they're doing it in person, um, their rights to a special education, that specialized instruction remains um, active. Um, so special education is a bundle of services. It is not a place. So this specially designed instruction can happen wherever that child is and wherever that child is engaging with that teacher, if it's on screen, if it's by phone, if it's by um, uh, a mixed bag of some in-person and some, uh, some virtual. Uh, it still ensures that access to the general curriculum is, is available and um, that creates a right to an appropriately ambitious education. Um, so this is not something that should be watered down, but should set uh, expectation of high, um, high standards for the child's um, education. And that's been made clear in case law. Um, uh, there was a recent case called Andrew, um, and that was very, very clear that, that we are talking in special education about am ambitious um, goals for their education, for the child's education. Um, so continuing with Maria's presentation and her slides, um, just a reminder that IEPs are goal-driven substantive documents. They are not checklists. They set out goals 
Um, uh, and they set out where the child is now. So the, what we call in Virginia, the PLOP, the present level of performance, um, is very much part of that IEP document. And it's very important that that is an accurate description of where the child is based on data um, collected from various sources. And then where we want that child to go, and that's dictated or defined by the goals in the IEP. Um, if a service is declined, um, if a parent or caregiver asks for a service um, during COVID or otherwise, and they are declined, um, it is important to talk up the team uh, for the team to talk about why that um, service was not able to be delivered. And the family should always ask for a prior written notice if it is not offered. And that is a, one of those procedural steps that is available in the law, very clearly written um, in regulation that uh, if a child, if a school denies or um, declines a request by a, a family that they must provide a prior written notice why that is why that has happened. Nationally, um, Maria talked about the importance of considering compensatory education. We are going to talk in a moment about how that concept is actually called recovery services during this COVID circumstance in Virginia. Um, and compensatory services need to be useful and usable, and they can be creative. They can be something different. They don't have to be something that has been delivered in the past or that don't have to be delivered in the same way they have been delivered in the past. Um, we recognize that during this COVID circumstance and the unique way that um, instruction is being delivered that IEP needs and goals may be different. But as always, families have the, the responsibility and I would say the obligation to always monitor their child's progress towards goals and make sure that IEP is being implemented as designed and that services are being delivered as designed and as specified. And it's especially important right now for families to keep track of that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is so important. So let's talk for a moment. So that, that's the conclusion of, of the slides I used for Maria's presentation. We're gonna talk now about content that was um, uh, delivered by Hank Millward from the Virginia Department of Education, as well as in some documentation that he cites, uh, Virginia documentation. And I will give you those sites in a moment. Uh, but recovery versus compensatory services. So we talked about compensatory services um, from Maria's presentation, and that is uh, that is a concept that is not explicitly defined in IDA, but is referenced in the statute and regulation and in case law and policy interpretations. So this term compensatory services are, is used when there is failure to implement a child's IEP, uh, failure to evaluate or reevaluate within required timelines, other violations of special education laws and regulations that impact on a child's ability to access or be provided a free appropriate public education. Um, you'll notice there's a little prince in that second bullet per VDOE is not applicable when a school closes. And so Virginia made um, some very clear um, attempt to, to clarify and some guidance uh, that it issued in 2020 um, about um, how it's interpreting compensatory service obligations um, and feels that uh, these requirements regarding compensatory services don't apply when a school closes. It's not available and the physical building is not available. So this is a phrase directly from VDOE when while IDEA provides for compensatory services when there is a denial of FAPE free appropriate public education, the services offered by Virginia school divisions to address a loss of services due to COVID-19 should be referred to as COVID recovery services. So Virginia has made a choice to um, not uh, consider the services to make up or recoup um, uh, what's lost during COVID-19, uh, made a decision to not call that call that compensatory services, but rather call it recovery service. So on the right hand side of the slide talks a little bit about what Virginia says is this thing called compensatory services. Um, and that is those are services that focus on recoupment, uh, recouping or recovering what skills were lost by this lack of uh, loss of service. Um, so in this case, um, families may need to request re recovery services and the IEP team needs to meet uh, to discuss recovery services. The team has to, and this is a quote from the VDOE materials, they should look at the totality of the circumstances for each student and determining the amount of service needed to remedy the educational deficits resulting from a failure to provide a FAPE. 
Um, so that's a, a long, wordy <laughs> statement that really focuses on the idea that um, that we're looking broadly, globally, at how much was lost um, and what's needed to remedy the deficits that resulted from the failure to provide a free, appropriate public ed education. Um, it is not, it's very clear in both federal and state guidance, that it is not a minute for minute, hour for hour um, tally. So if a child missed over the course of COVID 25 hours of instruction, specialized instruction, they do not have a right necessarily to that 25 hours uh, extra uh, to be delivered to recoup the loss. Uh, rather, they have to look at the totality of circumstances. So it's clearly there's a lot of um, judgments to be made by the by the team. Virginia is very clear, and this last bullet is straight from their materials as well, that parental input is key and that parent information and concerns must be considered in determining whether or not COVID recovery services are necessary for free appropriate public education, how much service time is needed, and how the services will be delivered. So it is clearly a tip of the hat to the fact that parents and caregivers have been largely running the show, monitoring the progress, implementing um, and reinforcing instruction um, that is directed by the schools, perhaps in virtual settings um, for the last year. So it is really important when this conversation happens about recovery services that parents and caregivers are asked for information and that their um, data, that the information, their input is, is considered. Four key resources on the left are two that are specific to this COVID situation. As I mentioned, VDOA is very clear that they're calling their um, recoupment option recovery services. And there is a document that uh, very clearly lays out um, how VDOE sees the delivery of those, um, determination and delivery of those services. So that's a really important document if you are in, um, engaging in conversations about recovery services. The other um, COVID specific document that is really, really uh, key to read is the, the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions. Um, and that is a evolving document. It, it's, it's updated periodically, and that's the VDOE Special Education and Student Services Frequently Asked Questions, and that can be found on the website to make sure you have the most, most recent one. Um, on the right-hand side are two documents that should already be on your shelf, hopefully, if you are a special education parent or caregiver. Um, the regulations, that's the purple book. If you have it in hard copy, it's the, it has a purple cover. Uh, otherwise, you can find it online, but that is uh, nothing new. Um, those regulations have been around and um, they are the implementing regulations for IDEA in the state. And it's really important that you are familiar with them and um, have them handy. And then finally, your procedural safeguard notice from your school, uh, which is given to you at evaluation and probably given to you annually at IEP meetings. And if there's any dispute um, uh, conversation, you are likely handed it again. Um, and you can find that online for your school division uh, as well. But those are, that lays out the options you have for resolving um, any disputes you might have and what your rights and responsibilities are. Um, it's not exciting reading, but it is important reading. So those two on the right are things that you probably have on your shelf, and the things on the left are things that you can access through the website or um, I think through this portal um, with this conference. Um, so our takeaways, uh, given all that, um, here are, here's my um, uh, broad recommendations in terms of being a, a parent or a caregiver of a child with a disability. First of all, um, uh, collect, I should say collect, collect and take lots of notes, data rec and records about where your child was before, during, and if we're going to say after COVID learning format. So if your child has returned to in-person learning um, full-time, whatever that might look like, um, you know, keep all the notes that you have, all observations that you've taken, um, uh, records of their performance on assessments and assignments, really important that you keep that because that may be key information as you make decisions with the team about recovery services. Um, be clear as you may have these conversations with the IEP team about your child's experiences at home and during hybrid conditions ask for reconsideration of present level statements, so the PLOP statements, uh, reconsideration of goals, reconsideration of instructional and related services um, across the domains. So maybe your child only had academic goals um, 
uh, and focus and in the IEP prior to COVID. And uh, it become has become clear that those needs have changed and perhaps they may have some social emotional um, uh, needs that uh, have surfaced. They might have some behavioral needs that have, have surfaced. And so those are things that you uh, can make a request as a part of the IEP team um, that, that be reconsidered and added into the IEP present level of performance as well as uh, goals that direct those. Uh, again, you will have data, hopefully, because you have been the one uh, sort of as, as, the, as the key observer, um, the key implementer over this last year. So you, the data that you bring should be considered. If the team does not agree to your request, be sure to get and keep any prior written notice statements that the school has um, given. If they haven't given you one, you need to ask for your prior written notice because again, that's a procedural document that begins to make a case for whether your child has been uh, receiving a FAPE or not. Um, ask your school about recovery services to recoup lost skills. Um, and they may not offer that conversation. And so you may need to be very explicit about requesting that conversation. Again, the team, um, uh, the IEP team needs to, to meet to have that conversation. Um, the meeting doesn't necessarily need to be in person, but they do need to meet. And then finally, if you have concerns or you're feeling like you're hitting a wall, um, contact us. If you're a foster, adoptive, and kinship family, we would love to talk with you. Uh, Pizzi, as I mentioned earlier, is our statewide parent training and information center uh, funded by the feds as we are. Um, uh, so P-E-A-T-C, P-E-A-T-C, Parent Education Advocacy Training Center.org uh, can help uh, all families across the state uh, if you have concerns about uh, where your child is and the needs that they may have. I will be back available on May 1st to talk in person about some of these things. Uh, look forward to that. Here's my email. In the meantime, you're always welcome to reach out, Form Families Forward website, and we have a host of social media uh, opportunities. So we hope that you join us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or all three, uh, because we do post our trainings, we do post um, announcements from other organizations, other things of, of interest. So I am going to conclude. I appreciate once again, you spending the time with me virtually, and I hope to see you on May 1st. Take care.